Hi, and welcome to the Expansive Podcast, where we explore the frontiers of personal growth, business innovation, and technology. We believe that growth and progress comes from expanding our minds, exploring new possibilities, and embracing change. My name is Eric. I'm one half of the Expansive Podcast. And as always, I am joined by my ever-elegant co-host, Mr. John Sane, sitting in, I think, Cape Town today. Welcome to the pod. Thank you very much. Uh, always <laughs> great to be on your pod, Eric. Thank you so much Thank for having you. me yeah. back every week. Um, <laughs> you're, I'm like you're, a constant guest. Yes. Yeah, the award-nominated pod, by the way. <laughs> no, just, oh, just, no, sorry, don't, sorry. Don't forget. Don't forget. Don't Double award-nominated. <laughs> yeah. I hope everybody's voted. In fact, we should post that again. A lot of people mentioned yes, to me that they voted. Sure. So thank you to everybody who has voted. Welcome everybody to this week's pod. I am in Cape Town this week. Next week I'll be in Berlin, which I'm really excited about because I've actually never been to Germany. So this is going to be really? another country that, yeah, I've never been to wow. Germany. So okay. yeah, yeah. And in fact, you know, two, two years ago, I started dreaming about going to Berlin and started chatting about it. And now it's two weeks in Berlin starts mm. on Friday. So I'm really looking forward to that, you know, so it's going to sure. be, it's going to be good adventuring you know, around Berlin. One thing I love about Europe is the, um, you know, as you walk through the cities, the architecture just takes you back in history and you just, Absolutely. you, you transport it all the time and you Absolutely. feel, uh, you feel like you're living it, which is amazing. Yeah. And then <laughs> taking it to the next level is that you have these old buildings, like this beautiful old architecture, but then there's like a Zara inside and it has this yeah. modern, hyper modern feel. I, I love that. It's always you know, one of my I, favorite I things about sitting, Europe. Yeah. But I remember sitting in Rome, having a coffee. And these is cobbled roads that the Romans built. I mean, these are 2000 mm. year old roads that people are still using. And I was sitting by the, near the Colosseum near. So I think there was some church somewhere or some Spanish steps or something. And I remember a, a, a electric, a scooter go past. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, what? I'm like in the future. I'm in the past. I'm like in this weird time zone yeah. uh, sort of uh, collapse. But like, Love I mean, it. I think Europe, Europe has had the sort of the, the longest sort of civilization, if you want to call it that, even though colonization wasn't very civilized, but just understanding the power of building ships, uh, understanding the steam engine really compounded their opportunity to become more civilized quicker and to mm. create the economic situation, the economic system, you know, they own, they own that, 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 that sector of the economy and they always will, uh, for this sort of, um, I suppose the sector or this timeline in our lifetimes. Mm. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be good. Um, I'm excited about it. It's also summer in Europe and uh, it's freezing oh, nuts yeah. here in Cape oh, Town. Yeah. So I'm quite happy to be leaving Cape Town. <laughs> Although it's funny, you know, I left Dubai because it was too hot. Now I'm in Cape Town. It's too cold. I'm like, geez, can you, get, can you find, can you find a happy place, bro? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Listen, um, so, so talking about uh, traveling the world uh, today, our theme is all around redefining ambition. That's uh, right. Which is a, a great theme to be talking about. <clears throat> um, and obviously it's been very top of mind for you recently. I think you've released quite a few videos that are all kind of in the same vein, you know? So it, it, it's also, it's also been top of mind for me just in that a team that I've been working with recently. Um, one of the, one of the people went away for like a, a week, you know, uh, taking some leave. And when she came back to work, she was bombarded with like 7,000 emails that you had to get wow. to. Wow. 7,000. And wow. this is obviously, you know, in the corporate machine, you get CC'd for everything, you know? Everything. And so it's yeah. like, you end up, like, you don't know where to touch base. When I spoke to her, she was like, I don't know where to start. I'm in meetings and people are talking about things and I have no idea where to even go and find yeah. them. And yeah. like to even just start catching up on 7,000 emails, like the, the pressure and the expectation of performance especially in big corporates is just something that uh, I think people often uh, don't appreciate or can't imagine what it's like to be uh, at that level and having to deal with that much pressure and expectation. So I think it's a very relevant topic that people will find uh, or will uh, harmonize with a lot. So, you know, kick us off. Yeah, sure. You know, I, my second book, I started off with a line and I've used it on this pod many times is, are you running away from the darkness or are you running towards the light? And what has happened to our society at large is that we've all been taught to run away from something without even realizing we're actually doing that. Mm. And what has happened is that we have been put under so much pressure from school to university to organizational structures 
that we've come to the point where we think it's normal to be under so much pressure, under so much adrenaline, under so much anxiousness. And I have watched people in corporates very close to me end their day with absolute panic that they haven't done enough. And this absolute panic and overwhelm that they haven't done enough bleeds into the next morning. In fact, let's even take it into the sleep at night where you're not sleeping mm. well because you're overwhelmed with the amount of work that you have to get through and the fact that everybody is putting you under the pressure to get this work done, but it's never ending. So you're 7,000 emails. Yeah. It's never ending. <laughs> and so what happens is that you're in a constant overwhelm. You wake up in the morning and now you, before you even start the day, you're overwhelmed with what's ahead of you, which means that your approach towards the tasks is already not creative, already mm. not collaborative, not lateral in its way of thinking. And so as the, 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 the wise old teachers say, it's never about what is happening. It's always about how you approach what is happening. And so what we've done in our society is we've created a line that's called uh, uh, divine discontentment. It's from David Ogilvy. And divine discontentment is this idea that you should never be happy. But they add a word divine in front of it to give it some spiritual term. And then somebody watched one of my videos and messaged me, Judith. Hi, Judith, if you're listening to the pod from Dubai. And Judith said to me, she used to work for Sol Kersner. And Sol Kersner had a value in Sun International that was good is not good enough. Mm. And I had another friend that I did some va value work with in his very big organization, multi-billion Rand organization. And he had a value in there that was brilliance or nothing. And so what you have is a society that is punishing you for not being good enough before you've even started the journey. You've already failed because <clears throat> you can't be, because if you're brilliant and you're not brilliant enough, then you're never brilliant enough, really. And if you're not good, you're never really good enough. And if you're running away from the darkness, not running towards the light, then those 7,000 emails become 10,000, 15,000, and you drown and you're just in a sea of overwhelm. But then here's the crux or here's the real sort of driver. You must be professional. This is what excellence is. This is how you push through your ceiling. This is how you become a better version of yourself. Let me tell you something. That is self-abuse. That is not you becoming a better version of yourself. That is abusing yourself, punishing yourself, telling yourself you're not good enough at the end of the day, which bleeds into the next day. And then all you are is running on a treadmill, trying to get acknowledgement from as many different people as possible. The whole thing is psychologically and emotionally void of any fascination, excitement, curiosity, or lateral thinking. The whole corporate system is based on you being scared of losing your job and security. It is based on an addiction to certainty. And so we don't even realize we're trapped by the idea of being excellent of being professional, of being breaking through your ceiling, because yes, you can. <laughs> and I'm going to say this right here. Tony Robbins, a crock of shit. Tony <laughs> Robbins is a 1990s hero in 2023. It's rubbish. Rubbish. It is a mental construct of you are not good enough like the army would do, is break you down to build you up. Mm. Today, what we've realized, there's an elegance to ambition. There's a calmness to your nervous system. There's a, a, a ambassadorial way to deal with reality that doesn't force things, that doesn't push yourself to a point of sickness to, for, so you can take medication because you're under so much stress that you're anxious that you have to take meditation to medication to numb yourself and calm yourself. And then you become a wine aficionado, which is another word for saying alcoholic. And it's just, it just keeps going and going. And what society's done is created this energy that's based on adrenaline. And then what we have is most people that I know has got a sugar sweet tooth. Why? They need a hit of sugar to get their energy up because they've exhausted themselves too much. So we have a, we have a global problem that calls professionalism and excellence. They think it's about professional excellence, but it's actually self-abuse. 
Yeah. So actually, what you what, what makes me think about is you know when I was running Think Week uh, back in 2020, you know we had different days and different themes, and the one day's theme was about your future vision. And what would typically happen is, you know, I would set the stage I and mean, I would say, okay, well, uh, when I think of my future vision, you know, it's like global this and doing that and earning this and whatever. But, you know, I, I set the bar quite high for myself in this regard. And then I'd hand it over to the participants and I'd go, okay, it's, it's your turn. So go away, think about it, uh, design your future vision, and then come back and let's all talk about it. And inevitably what would happen is uh, people would come with these very grandiose visions for the future. And then there'd be some people that would go, but all I want really is just like to be at home with my two dogs and, and my wife. And, uh, you know, we have enough to look after ourselves, but we're having a good time. And for that, they felt very insufficient. They felt like, like, is this enough? Am I, am I aspiring to enough? And I actually even recently had a conversation with someone who's very successful, but they were like, but am I living into my full potential? Shouldn't I be pushing much harder? Like, yes, I have like more, I can, I can re essentially they could retire today and be fine for the rest of their lives. That's how much money they have in the bank. But they were like, I don't know, like I could be earning two or three times what I'm earning right now if I just pushed a bit harder. So should I be pushing a bit harder? Because am I not doing myself a disservice? I'm not living into my full potential. And that became like, it, it's a quite a, a big thing for them, you know, in the same way that, purpose is often a very big thing. Like people get so frustrated and they become so creatively blocked because all they can think about is what is my why? And if I can't find my why, then who am I? What am I going to do with my life? And I feel like this goes hand in hand with, with uh, what you're talking about is that there's this purpose thing. Like I need to find my purpose. And then there's potential on the other side of it, which is that you can do so much more. You can be so much more, but you have to push so much harder. And at what point do you go, well, I don't need to do all of that. I just, I just, I can just do what I need to do or, or just do what I, what I feel I want to do. And, and that's a tough thing to find. It's a tough balance to strike. You're absolutely right. It's a tough balance to strike until you only ask yourself one question. Am I enough? And do I deserve what's coming at me? Or do I need to keep working hard and hurting myself to get what I need? And so if you think about it, people have created stories around what it, gets or takes for you to make money. So if you think about back when we were kids, remember the 24 hour cafes that used to be around, they used to be owned or 18 hour cafes. They used to be owned by Portuguese families. Mm. I'm sure you had them. I had them. in yeah, yeah. There was like three or four Portuguese families. Those Portuguese families thought they had to live in the shops to make money. Okay. That was the story they told themselves. I must kill myself, live in my shop to earn some money. Okay. Then you get, Greeks and all my Greek friends here, bless you. Sa um, I can't even remember my Greek words now, but uh, <laughs> Greek, my Greek friends that always own restaurants, they always had to be stressing about somebody stealing from them, where there was a supplier, an employee, a customer. There was always this tone that somebody was taking advantage of them. And if you think about the Greek culture, they have those evil eyes and they all wear their evil eyes because in their world, somebody is throwing some juju at them. Now, mm. in their world, if they're not stressing about somebody stealing from them and busting them, they don't think they deserve money. So then let's go to my Jewish friends. And my Jewish friends are landlords, a lot of them. And they don't really work. They're like, yeah, they're very strategic. <laughs> they understand financing excellently. They are, they are property owners and landlords. Look at their story compared to the Portuguese family, think compared to the Greek family, and just keep going. And if you think about Iranians, and I see Iranians in, from Iran, Oh my God, the biggest martyrs, the whole world's against them. Everything's unfair. They have to make money under this guise of huge suffering. Now, respect to all of you because these are cultural norms that you've bought into as a culture. So if you think about it on a broad scale, the corporate world has created a culture, a subculture that says you're actually never good enough. You're actually never good enough. And you've got to keep proving your worth on a continuous basis so that we can continuously say, well done to you. And you know what it reminds me of, Eric? High school. Mm. It's high school. It's high school with adults, with offices that look like classrooms. And so we have the principal, the head of departments, the teachers, the prefects. 
what do we have? CEO, directors, executives. I was working with Standard Bank once many years ago, and there was me in the room with the rest of the adults that we were doing work with. And I say adults because this is weird to me. And then the CEO arrives. And let me tell you, these adults, adults in their 40s, 50s, and 60s got scared and quiet and sat in their chairs like high school kids in trouble with a, pri with a principal coming mm. in. I was like, and I, was, I was sitting there, I was like, what just happened? Like, what? Are we not, what? I must be scared of somebody or something. Sure. I'm 48 years old. What am I going to be scared of? When am I going to stop being scared? And so, again, all of this comes down to with us following a process. We're not aware that we're even following because it's become so normal. So you've got to ask yourself, do you wake up overwhelmed? Do you end your day asking whether you should have done more and then berating yourself that you haven't done more and then call it integrity, professionalism, and excellence? Let me tell you something. You're duping yourself mm. because you're going to get to the end of your life and all you're going to have is money and anxiousness. And good for you because now all that money in the world is not good enough because you're anxious. And so we've got to really rethink ambition. And if we really want to understand what it actually looks like is unhooking ourselves from an outcome, which is a very hard thing to do because when you're in survival mode, when you're not good enough, all you're focusing on is an outcome. You're not focusing about a process an excitement, a curiosity, a passion. It's irrelevant, irrelevant. And you said it really well, which I've actually started to use as well, is moral courage is doing the right thing when nobody's watching. And when you are in survival mode, you have zero morals, not because you're a bad person. It's because what you've said to yourself over and over and over and over is I'm not good enough. I need to do more. I'm overwhelmed. And I need to do what it takes to be seen by the right people so I can have that tick box like I did at high school. Mm. And so we have to unhinge ourselves from an outcome. That's the first thing. The second thing is when you start to access your curiosity, your excitement, and your fascination, you become so enthralled in that practice, in that process, that that flow state starts to become your priority of energy focus. And when that becomes your priority of energy focus, and that that's the only thing you do, now you're not in survival mode. Now you're in creativity mode. And in creativity mode, the fact that you've accessed creativity mode is the end result. That is the end result. There's no other end result. Then the end result starts to take care of itself because you're in the highest form of your creativity, lateral thinking. And in fact, what you're actually doing is accessing your genius, your genius, your uniqueness, and the currency that's going to make you stand out from the rest of the world because of who you are, not because of the system you followed, not because of the adrenaline you pump through your body, and not because you're running away from something, but truly running towards something that's exciting you. This stops you from defining ambition in a place that makes you insecure, not enough, and insufficient to a place of, I am enough, I'm moving in the right direction, and I'm doing it calmly, collaboratively, and creatively. Mm, sure. Yeah, very, very good. Um, I love what you said about, uh, you know, if you, if you continue down the path uh, without, without getting out of survival mode, without reconfiguring what ambition looks like for you, you end up with anxiousness and money. <laughs> Like, yeah, rich, it, rich it, anxiousness. That's a brilliant, yeah. brilliant mix. Brilliant mix. That, that really hits, hits hard. Yeah, um, yeah. So, a, a few, so you're in your Porsche. So you're in your Porsche and you're on two Prozacs. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You've won. Yeah. You've, well, won. You, you've won the game. Well, you know, they you always the say that you, you, I'd rather cry in my Porsche. You know, you, you know that saying. No, no, no. <laughs> happy, happy. We're all going to cry whether you're on Prozac yeah. or not. Don't, don't worry. Whether you're gonna, I'm always crying as well. So I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. I'm saying it's a trap. Yeah, it's a I agree. trap because you think you've got the Chanel bag. You thought that's what it was. You know, let me let me give you one exa another example because is a, I'm very passionate about this. Obviously, as you can see, I was standing in the queue uh, at an airport in a passport queue, and I, I was flying business. And there was a guy sitting near me, and he was wearing a full Louis Vuitton tracksuit, which already for me is what a knob. But anyway, yeah. that's just me. Yeah, yeah. And so he's there in his, in his Gucci bag, Louis Vuitton tracksuit. Obviously, you know, like I'm cool. I'm traveling business. I'm okay, cool, cool, cool. No problem. Happy for you. We get to the queue. He starts freaking out, 
freaking out at the security guy because there's a passport queue. Like, I, bro, I've been to in San Francisco. I waited three hours for my passport queue. San Francisco. This is one of the top cities in the world. So he's in the South African queue and he's freaking out, right? <laughs> and I thought to myself, this poor sod with that tracksuit and that and his nervous system is shot, shot. And if you think about it, people that are wearing those brands that need to be seen in those brands are already starting from a back foot that says, I'm not good enough. I need to have a brand that represents me to show the rest of the world that I'm rich so that I can feel relaxed within myself. And then when I come into a queue that I can't fast track, I'm going to freak out. Mm. It's exactly the same energy. And I mm. thought to myself, all that money, my friend, all that money. And here you are deeply anxious mm. about standing in a queue. You've lost the game, bro. You've lost the game. Um, there's a, uh, have you ever watched The Greatest Showman? Yes, I love it. I've, I've rewatched that thing too many times. And yeah. there's a line in it where, uh, so obviously Hugh Jackman, he's the, the main character and he yeah. goes from nothing to something. Yeah. And he invites, um, I, I'm not sure if he invited his wife's parents, but his the parents never approved of him. Like they always looked yeah. down on him. Yeah. And so he invites them or they, or they arrive at one of his shows and he acts very patronizing towards the dad and the dad turns to him and he says all that money and still just a tailor's boy Oof. and i think that that speaks exactly to what you're saying Oof. you see we yeah. measure money and brands as success mm. and it's a broken system because you know what i've had those brands i've had mm. those cars i've had those houses miserable dude miserable <laughs> Uh, one of my very first coaching clients that I had was a Mediterranean guy that grew up with in, in a family where if you finished school, you would go and work in the cafe and weekends you were in the cafe. Like that was, that was what you did. You know, it was either school or in the cafe. And when he came to me, the first thing that we wanted to work on was that he wanted to be more, uh, regular in his gym time so like he wanted to to get to the gym more consistently and i said to him cool like i mean i was a, a young coach you know so i was like oh well it, it's fine we can work on this um and he said he thinks that his biggest challenge here is time management so i said fine uh, let's do a time management program for you and we sat down and we looked at his calendar and we said well where does it make most sense for you to slot like gym time in and we had a, a plan he left the session everyone was happy uh, the first week out of the session, he went to the gym four times, the week after that, three times, the week after that, twice, and then he didn't go back at all. And, and the reason why this actually happened, so when we spoke the next time in session, I said to him, you know, um, obviously it's not a time management issue because we identified the exact slots that you needed to go and train. So it's not a time management issue. Uh, tell me about how you felt when you arrived at the gym. And his answer to me was guilty. Yeah. And I said, why? And he's like, because yeah. I'm here and other people are working. I'm here and I should be at my business. And I said to him, do you see that actually the work that needs to be done here isn't time management. That's what we always default to because we think we can fix it with um, technicalities or structure or just doing stuff. That's not what's going to fix this because you're always going to feel guilty. What you need to do is you need to recalibrate an identity that has become so entrenched with the way that you do work that you can't see yourself as a person who isn't working. And it's only until you start having that awareness and start shifting that awareness that you are more than just work, that you will actually break through from the cycle and you'll actually have a more balanced, more integrative life. And it was interesting to me that that's always what we want to go to. We always want to go to the, the fixing of the thing when really where it needs to start is with the redefining <laughs> of who you are. And we speak about this all the time, that we have to see these patterns that we've created over time and how they influence where we are and where we are going. You said it so well, you know, because no matter how much money you make, it won't be enough. And no matter how much you do, it won't be enough. And every time you take a break, you'll feel guilty and you'll be overwhelmed. And so what happens is it's irrelevant what's going on on the outside, your approach to it is this is a stuff up before mm. it's even started. And you know what I used to do this with, which is so weird, and I've actually never spoken about this, 
is I used to do this with relationships, not just, not just intimate relationships, but all relationships. I used to think it's only a matter of time till we fight. Mm, and the sure. reason I used to do this is because my family structure was built on angry shouting, everybody was shouting, everybody was impatient. So I always used to think that everything always comes to a blow eventually, and then it's over. Mm. And so I've got a string of friendships behind me that I had preempted based on my lack of who I was and what I was bringing to the party and thinking that all friendships end eventually in some powwow because of my upbringing. And I've got a string of friendships behind me that I've done this to. And I'm like, why did I do that? And I don't even know why I did it because I'm not a bad person, but I expected it to. Now, when you wake up in the morning and you think today's going to be a stuff up, you've already decided it's going to be a stuff up. You go to bed mm. overwhelmed that you haven't done enough. Look, you're just in a loop, in a terrible, horrible loop, earning lots of money, living supposedly the life that you thought you wanted to live with that sort of salary and that sort of position to have that sort of house. But here you are in a, in a pool of anxiousness. Like what's the, what is the actual point? There's no point. It's like a ridiculous game that we've been duped to play. And so I'm just becoming more and more aware of it. And I did a ceremony, a Silas Island, Silas Sybin ceremony a few months ago. And my request before the ceremony was, how do I become more elegant in my ambition? And this is the exact same thing is that this rushing is not elegant. This continuously deprecating yourself is not elegant. To keep saying you haven't done enough at the end of the day is irritating, not elegant. To everybody mm. around you, not just you, your whole family's suffering, your friends are suffering, everybody's suffering because you keep self-deprecating. So I went into the psilocybin ceremony and I asked, how do I make my ambition more elegant? And the response I got was, respect yourself more mm. and you'll respect the process more. And in that way, you'll become more patient in the process and more elegant. So let's break this down and close this, this, this podcast end of this is that if you're in a rush and if you're overwhelmed and if you think you haven't done enough, it comes down to one very clear thing. You don't respect yourself enough. And if you respected yourself, you wouldn't rush, you wouldn't be overwhelmed and you would think that you've done just what you needed to have done by the end of the day. Not that you have done, should have done more. Tomorrow's another day. And here's the biggest clincher. It never ends. So if you keep self-deprecating yourself now and thinking it will stop once you've achieved X, Y, and Z, you're fooling yourself. You never arrive. You don't mm. arrive. There's no arrival. The journey is the arrival. So as you're going on this journey, you're thinking that by when I, when I tick box X, I'll be done. And uh, no, because mm. when box X is ticked, there'll be box Y, Z, A, B, D, and it'll keep moving. Mm. So this comes down also to you, Eric. You remember when we first started this podcast, I remember how you were so discontent. You should have always been doing more. You should. I remember that there was always a conversation you used to have. You've totally changed. You know, you're not like that at all. You're like, you're quite content in what you're doing. You're more relaxed within yourself. And you know what you are? More pleasant to be around. <laughs> Thank you. Honestly. Yeah. No, because, I mean, look, look, it started at a very low base. I mean, it's still a two out of 10. But um, <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is when you keep doing that, you think you're doing yourself a favor, but you're actually irritating me and yourself because you keep saying Eric shit. Eric shit, Eric shit, Eric shit, Eric shit, Eric shit. And the universe keeps saying, oh, Eric shit. Here's another reason for you to think Eric shit. Oh, you also still think Eric shit. Here's another reason that Eric shit. Mm. Well, look, I think what, I, what I've experienced has always been um, the curse of high performance. And this mm. is what I see with, with all the high performers that I work with, is that mm. the bar is always so high in your mind that if you're mm. not getting to that, which I, I, I guess is the, the, the point of this podcast today, mm. um, you just don't feel like you are, are doing enough and getting mm. enough. And there's this mm. impatience that develops, you know, and this is mm. why we also spoke about accretion last week. Mm. Is that there's a, I, th I think we do need a level of impatience in that we should be giving our best every single day to advance mm. towards the goals that we have. Mm. But that impatience shouldn't spill over into frustration and anxiety mm. there needs to be some sort of a stopping point where it doesn't go over into your character that you have mm. the impatience about the work that you must do but you have patience and elegance and relaxation about who you are and trusting in the journey and the process that's getting you to where you need to go mm. and, and that's always been very tough and i think that's what i've become better at is is just to to give myself a bit more space to give myself mm. a bit more time 
Mm. And, and I think this really just comes from, from looking at the people around you and realizing that this has been everyone's journey. So mm. that's why I saying to you when we were discussing this offline, that I think there's a very nice tie into accretion when we talk about this, because it's so important to get to the end of the day and to realize, okay, I've done X, Y, and Z, well done. Like I've, mm. I've made progress, I've advanced. Mm. Exactly. And, you know, when you were talking, what it made me think about was, you remember at school, you know, you'd always have these people who would get like a, a 92% on their Ossals. test or report. They were called, they were yeah. called assholes. Assholes. Yeah, yeah, I remember them. But, yeah. what, but what made them an asshole is the fact that they would go, oh, but I didn't really study for this. Or oh, Yo. I should have like, <laughs> can't believe I got, you know. <laughs> My least favorite type of people because I was failing nonstop. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and it's also like, can you just appreciate what you've done instead of trying to deprecate um, yeah, 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 where you yeah, are at? Yeah. But yeah. in the in the process of what you're doing is you're also making everyone else feel like crap as well. You know, that's yeah. what's happening in that in that moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I also wanted to say that, uh, or I, I wanted to quickly just touch back to what we were saying about potential, because I think this is part of the, uh, the frustration that emerges is that mm. you always have a certain level of, poten- uh, of performance and then you have a certain level of potential. And there's always going to be a gap that exists between your current level of performance and the mm. potential that you could get to. So your business could be 10x bigger. Um, mm. The way that you get onto stage could be 10x better, whatever that mm. might look like. And, mm. and there's always, we've spoken about this many times, there are always levels to what we do. And those mm. levels are the levels of potential that we could get to. Mm. But I think what I've also become a lot more cognizant of is that potential is finite. You know, may, maybe a way to conceptualize potential in a way is that you get given a hundred points of potential, mm. but you have to decide how you're going to distribute those, those potential points because you can't be the best husband and the best dog dad and the best speaker in the world and build the biggest business in the world. And, you know, it, like at some point, unfortunately, your potential becomes linked to the time that you have. Mm. And so you have to decide where you're going to spend those potential points. And maybe when we are more intentional with that and we decide from a place of uh, truth and honesty for ourselves about where we want to spend those points, we can also start like just relaxing a bit because mm. then you realize that, okay, if, if John wants to go and spend 80 out of uh, 100 points on building his career, it means mm. he has 20 left for things like, relationships Mm. and Mm. whatever that might be. Right. Mm. So do you want to like, then the comparison game doesn't make sense anymore. And then Mm. you don't get that frustration anymore because you're like, Mm. well, the distribution of my points are what they are. Mm. And I can just try and do the best in those areas. I don't have to worry about this incredible potential that is lurking in the back of my mind. I've laid it out for myself. And I think that there's a, a bit of, a peace of mind that maybe comes with that and that we can also then stop punishing ourselves for not living into this full potential when you realize that full potential isn't just like in one area of your life full potential is across the span of your life and so how you distribute those points matter but it's up to you like don't worry about other people don't worry about the organization don't worry about you know um people saying to you oh but you need to live into your full potential in one specific aspect of your life they don't get it, that it's not about, you can't do that. Um, if you want to be Carlos Alcaraz to go and win like Wimbledon, I can promise you his life is incredibly asymmetrical. And the reason for that is because he's the best in the world. And if you want to be the best in the world, you need an asymmetry in how you distribute those potential points. Um, and at some point, he'll recalibrate and he'll redistribute those points. But that's how it goes. You know, if you want to be the absolute best, be okay with the asymmetry, be okay with the, the pressure and everything that comes with that. If you, uh, if you want to redefine ambition for yourself and assume that you're not Scott Alcaraz or Carlos Alcaraz um, or going to be the best in the world in what you do, then I think there's a, a letting go that can happen. It's a bit of my rant. I don't know. What do you think? And no, I agree with you. And I love that you got into a rant about it, you know, because I think it's your, it, it, what you're talking about is your own life. It's like, you've also got to get to the point where how much time you're spending with Danica and your dogs and, 
you know, are you, while you with Danica and your dogs, are you berating yourself that you haven't done enough work mm. at work? Mm. And like, it's a horrible place to be because you'll never find peace, you know? And, and it is also very personal for me because I'm also tired of being foolishly ambitious foolishly ambitious because here I am traveling the world, earning a lot of money doing what I'm doing. And then what, should I still be unhappy? Like, come on, dude. Like, when are you going to like, when are you just going to sit back and go, okay, wow, well done, dude. Oh, wow. Mm. Well done. Mm. You've done so good. And this is what happened to me last year in Dr. Joe, June. I realized that I've been telling the world for the, for my whole life that I'm not successful. And the minute I started to change that, that I am successful, I didn't become more lazy I become more relaxed into my success and that then becomes more of my reality. It just changes the dynamic of my heart and the clearing of my head to approach it with a state of, ah, instead mm. of a, ah, ah, mm. which is always the thing, right? <laughs> anyway, that's it for the pod I, I, this week. I, I have one mm. last question for you before, before mm. I let you go. Um, mm. So, you know, for us to talk about redefining ambition for ourselves is one thing because mm. we are, uh, we run our own businesses. When you are in a large organization, a lot of that isn't up to you, right? Like the, the plate mm. of never ending tasks uh, is laid before you every single day. Mm. Um, and the expectation is that you need to get to it, all of it as much as possible. So mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you think someone who is in that cycle, um, in an organization where the expectation is high, pressure is high, how do they approach redefining ambition? Do they leave? I, do they leave no, or do they stay? No. And yeah. No, well, I think it's too broad a question to answer it specifically. I don't, it's unfair because everything's got its own ideology uh, or, or, or sort of nuances. But I, but I think most importantly is where are your boundaries? Yeah. What is your boundary set on? And how are you allowing people to get over your boundary, disrespect your boundary, and you've let it happen for so long that now people expect them to walk all over your boundaries. And so you've got to go back and ask yourself, what is most important to me? Where are my boundaries? And where do I not allow people to get over my boundaries? Now, sometimes the job that you're in won't accept your new boundary. So you'll have to leave. But remember that if you don't set boundaries for the next job or the next relationship you go in, guess what? You're going to have boundaries walked all over again. So it comes down to your self-worth, what value you're adding and where your boundaries lie. And this is a deep, deep, process that you need to go through to realize what am I worth? How am I being bullied? Who's taking advantage of me? Why am I allowing them to do this to me? And so it's really just a, a mm. discussion with yourself and your coach around your self-worth and your boundaries. Perfect. I think that is the pod. Everyone, uh, thank you very much for tuning in to another episode of The Expansive. It's always great to have you with us. Uh, as we've mentioned before, the Expansive is up for two nominations, two awards. Uh, and this is from the Association of African Podcasters and Voice Artists. And we are in the career and entrepreneurship category and the technology and innovation category. So if you enjoy the pod, uh, please go in and look us up on socials and you'll find a link to go and vote for both awards. Uh, because the one thing we love more than saying that we are co-hosts of the Expansive is to say that we are co-hosts of the award-winning podcast called The Expansive. So we appreciate your help in getting us there. Uh, if you found this useful, then definitely share with a friend. And until next week, be expansive.